Few looks in nature are as iconic as the zebra's stripes. But these savanna equines rarely think about fashion. So these stripes must have a function beyond their form. You may think you know what these patterns are for. So you might be surprised to know that there is an ongoing debate among researchers over their true purpose. We may never know for sure what secrets these zealous zebras hide, but it never hurts to try to uncover the mysteries of life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more, more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can visit us at our home on the web at ltaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patrons, to Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, Richard Kaspar, Lottie and Aubrey, thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for helping us keep the lights on. And today we're talking about a fashion icon that is more interested in function over form. But more on that later. An animal after my own heart. I only think that about him because all animals are more interested in function over form. Yeah, well, even even the flashy form stuff has a... Um, has a practical function like bird displays and stuff like that except for maybe those chimpanzees that are like pets but then they end up ripping someone's arm off because they were somebody showed up wearing a different hat than usual <laughs> <laughs> well they that's because that person was wearing a hat that was definitely form over function <laughs> the chimpanzees <laughs> yeah. just hate impracticality yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, uh, but what are we talking about? We're 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 hitting one of one of the big leagues. Mm-hmm. We're it's been a we've been covering a lot of obscure and frankly microscopic animals. <laughs> I'm not pointing any fingers. Um, but now we're we're back to the back to the all stars the uh, the A list actors. Um. We're talking about the zebra. The zebra. The plain zebra, to be s- precise. Yeah, I was like uh, looking through the list, thinking of stuff to do, and I was like, I can't believe you haven't done the zebra. We talk about the zebra a lot with this whole what what in conjunction with what the major fact is. Um, and yeah, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll learn some stuff. Yeah, it seems like we will. But uh, we're—it's called the zebra. You know it. You, you're already uh, familiar, but what we're going to call it here is uh, the Mormon Marty, the Serengeti Sister Wives, and Zebra Joe Rupp. <laughs> I oh, that's uh, that's Kitty that 70 show. Kitty from that yeah. 70 show. I was like. Usually, when you have a, a like a, there's a common name like Deborah. You're just like, oh, like this famous person in my head, like a household name, easy. Um, but there's Deborah. I was like, I don't, I can't think of a single famous Deborah. And I looked it up, and the most famous Deborahs are people I've never heard of before, like Canadian singers, songwriters, and stuff like that. So the only Deborah that is a household name to me is Deborah Joe Rupp. So, uh, which is, I uh, nobody. The only one I can think is. of is the character from everybody loves Raymond. Yeah. I never watched that. It's the, that, that's the, that's one of those sitcoms I missed out on. Let's taxonomize this. Let's. It's in a kingdom, you know, love and are in that kingdom is animalia. The phylum is Chordata. Uh, the class is Mammalia. The order is Parasodactyla. Parasodactyla. The family is Equidae. So we're talking about horses. The <laughs> genus is Equus. Double horses. 
The subgenus is Hippotigris. Also horses and tigers. Equus Hippotigris is horse, horse, tiger. That's what that means. <laughs> and I think that, well, obviously we're not uh, going to do nitty gritty nomenclature, but like that's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, you're just like, oh, we're going to use the Latin word for horse for the genus. And then we're going to use the Greek word for horse for the subgenus. And Does then tigris mean stripes. No, it just means tiger. <laughs> okay. Um, and the species is quagga. That, that sounds like an Australian thing to say if I've ever heard it. Yeah. So there's some interesting taxonomy things. So I, when you asked me that, like you were asking me earlier, which uh, what's the binomial name or which one which one are we doing? I just double checked to see the if the one I put down is the right one, and it brought me to an an extinct animal, the quagga. And then I'm like, oh no, did I choose the right the wrong one? So what happened is, in the 1700s, a guy just found and described the quagga. A zebra in an area that is now extinct. Then another guy in the 1800s found, described what he thought was another zebra. So it was became whatever, Equus tigris. Tigris, whatever. I forget what he just Hippo said. Hippo tigris. Hippo tigris. But then later they found, oh, the plains zebra is the the hippotigris that is just the same species quagga is just a plain zebra um from <laughs> not olden a times not a plain zebra it's a plains, plains. zebra zebra yeah. it's a zebra that only uses the white color in, in magic the gathering yeah so the there they used to be a different thing but now plain zebras are Equus quagga. It's just a simple misunderstanding. Yeah. Among taxonomists and friends. Uh, what does it... Do you have a game we could play? I sure do. Now that uh, we've gotten that taxonomy out of the way, it's time for my favorite part of the show. C -c -c Critter groups. Obviously, we're not going to do nitty-gritty nomenclature because I just told you that it's a horse, horse, tiger. Um... Although we could do Quagga. I don't know. I haven't looked it up. But so this is the part of the show where I ask you, Joe, a question. And that question is the same every time. What is the name of a group of this animal? Or what is the term of venery? Or what is the collective noun? We are talking zebra families in particular. Um, not the whole group. But what is a family unit of zebras called? Is it called A? A harem, B, a gallop, C, a pattern, or D, a clop. A harem, final answer. Ding, 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 you are correct. It is a harem of zebras. I guess that's yeah, the only when one you said it was like the fa oh, it's just a family. It's a group of family members. I, it's they don't do they don't make silly terms of venery for family groups just for collections so a harem actually is like a family an animal group. style family group yeah and it's a human style family group fair enough yeah um yeah so a harem of zebras which uh i will talk about more about why that is later on oh yes i did actually look up and i forgot i put it in my uh, little notes here what quagga means uh it is a south african dutch onomatopoeia for the z sound the zebra makes and huh. I, I don't know what the extinct version of the zebra sounded like but normal zebras don't say quagga <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> it's funny because like my kids like to watch these animal shows and stuff like that. And the onomatopoeia for uh, an elephant is poo -woo. 
And when I first heard it, it was like I was making fun of it. My wife and I were making fun of it. It was like, poo-woo. That's what the elephant says. But like, it's not that far off. poo You know, it's not, you, yeah. know, you can see it being like it making sense. But a quagga? Quagga? For a zebra. Like zebras that make that like, that high-pitched whooping sound. <laughs> that doesn't sound like quagga at all. Yeah, there's no G's in there. Maybe there's another way to pronounce it in South African Dutch that I'm just not understanding, but I'm sure it's not that far off from quagga. Q-U-A-G-G-A. But there you have it. That's why that's the species name. Very interesting. Now, what could this strange animal possibly look like? <laughs> Uh, it looks like a zebra. So I don't know what you're wanting from me at this point. No, <laughs> it has that classic horse look like a tall, lanky dog with rocks on its feet. Uh, it looks like kind of like <laughs> a stubby version of a horse. So it has shorter legs. It's smaller. It weighs less than your typical, you know, riding, Amer you know, riding horse. Um, I don't I don't know what you call it. It's just a horse. I want to call it a riding horse. I don't know all the different breeds. Um, Clydesdale is one. That, and that's mm -hmm. it. That's all I've got. Tennessee um, walking horse. What? Ta Tennessee walking Tennessee horse. Tennessee walking horse. It. That sounds like... Mm -hmm. um, I want to mix it with Coke. And, and, the and, only and reason I it. know that is because of... Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember Red Dead Redemption having its individual horse uh, breeds in there. And I don't remember a single one. Um, I just know Clydesdales because that's, I mean, that's an easy one to remember. Um, basically, a zebra is a, is a pony with black and white stripes. Uh, it has a short buzz cut mane. So while horses can sometimes have these long flowing manes, zebras always have like a like a army drill sergeant, lieutenant surge cut going going down. Uh, even though they don't cut it, this is uh, it's how long it gets. Um, and the stripes on the mane match the stripes on its body. Um, and I think that I mean everything else has to do with the the size of it. So how how big is zebra i mean we did say that it was smaller than a horse but is it smaller than all the horses yeah uh, no because there's like tiny little uh there's little horses teacup horses um <laughs> welcome to the beloved measure up segment the official listeners favorite part of the show the part of the show when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family it's also a part of the show that's introduced by you when you send in audio yourself saying singing or chittering or making that quagga sound or quagga -ing. Uh, i want to hear the words measure up. i would love to hear a good quagga of measure up into ld uh, ld taxonomy at gmail.com we do have a new measure up intro this week yes from melissa do you know do you remember melissa she is a fan with the fan. The fan fan. I want to hear the, the, fanfare. The, 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 the fanfare, the metallic scraping of measure up. <laughs> uh, we're, she, she wrote um, after listening to our uh, Demodex Might episode, currently listening to your disturbing Might Face Eaters episode. As you guys ponder how sleep might affect population, it made me remember back when I pulled all-nighters, my face would always be extra oily. So, as you just rightly put it, who knows? Off to wash my face with sandpaper. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, that night I definitely scrubbed a little bit harder with the, <laughs> with the soap. I was just like, ah, maybe I could get into those pores and get rid of those, some of those guys. But it's true. The longer you, like when you're staying up late, you do feel oilier. So maybe you you need to get to sleep and get the, uh, get the night crew to come and 
vacuum your forehead. I just need those little, those those tiny little sebum zambonis to yeah. <laughs> to to mop up the 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 gross extra uh, grease <laughs> face grease that I make. Um, uh, yeah, delicious. In, so, at the end of her email, she says. While I'm here, might as well pay my dues. And she's referring to the measure up intro she's attached. So awesome. without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. Measure up. It maybe measure down this time. <laughs> Oh, can we please measure down? <laughs> How do we measure down? I don't know, but I'm happy to hear the return of that fan. <laughs> it did what did sound like there was a fan in the background this time again. Either that uh, or like a or a, an out of balance washing machine on the spin cycle. <laughs> she lives in such a dynamic environment. <laughs> it's yeah, there's just a lot of like sound sampling that you can you can get from from that environment well thank you melissa once again yes thank you uh and uh thanks for listening to our most disturbing episode or at least top five most disturbing episodes yeah i don't know if it necessarily takes the cake a pomus beetle yeah but this one is very like this this one is very personal it hits it's like watching a normal horror movie and then watching Paranormal Activity. It's like, oh, that was all out there. But this one's in here. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but thank you again. Thanks for the measure up. It's been a couple of weeks. More than a couple, you, you could even say. Yeah. But let's get into it. Let's talk about height. They're between 127 and 140 centimeters, or 50 to 55 inches tall at the withers. How many zebras go into the height of the Senegalia Senegal tree? Steven Seagal tree. The Steven Seagal tree. He's a very tall and competent fighter, so (laughs) we have a lot to work with. Here's a hint. The Senegalia Senegal is a source of gum Arab, Ar- Arab- Arabica. 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 Uh, which is used as an emulsifying agent in food products, among many other things. This is that tree that's like the quintessential African savanna. You might find a leopard in it. The tree that like the canopy of it. The, that the leaves Rafiki are lives long in. and horizontal. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, not the not the like big fat trunk tree. No, not the Rafiki tree. Okay. This is like a big poinsettia or something like that. In no way is it a big poinsettia, but or wait, no, no, poinciana. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Poinsettia is the little, is, the little red yeah. one. Poinciana, tall tree with the with the big like umbrella, Doctor Seuss canopy. Yes, it is very umbrella shaped. Um. So the height of one of these trees. Yes. Uh. Oh wait, wait. The upper end of average height. Upper end of average. I will say. 40 feet 480 inches divided by 55 puts us at 8.7 uh zebras at the withers go into the height of one of these classic african trees final answer yes well you are going to be a nurse because that is a nursing school victory. 8.7 on the dot. Oh, ho, 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 ho. nice. A gum Arabica tree is 40 feet tall. Oh, wow. <laughs> Do I know my trees or what? Don't, don't answer that. 
your you know trees better than you know mountains. I, yeah. But don't like don't most of us. That's fair. <laughs> There's a lot more margin for error with mountains. Let's talk about weight. They're 210 to 325 kilograms or 450 485 to 710 pounds. 710, that's a big it's heavy for a pony. Clydesdale's probably like pushing the 1200s. I'm just kind of still basking, maybe <laughs> even marinating in that just just out of this park home run I hit uh, for a second. <laughs> okay. Oh, Clydesdale can be 2,000 pounds. Yeah, those things are in, in, enormous. I recently saw yeah. some uh, mounted officers uh, outside of a Publix I was at, and I was like, man, those are really big horses. So how many little Debbie zebra cakes would a zebra have to eat to eat its weight in little Deborah zebra cakes? That was that was the joke that Bibby wanted me to make. Was, little Debbie? Yeah, it was little little Debbie. Um and then I took I took the idea of Deborah and then I ran with it in the just the opposite direction. <laughs> but Debbie is Deborah. I know, but De like you don't say little Deborah cakes. <laughs> I'm not gonna say little Deborah little zebra. That's not a good pun. <laughs> <Little Zebby. Zebby. laughs> uh here's a hint if you don't know little debbie's zebra cakes are sponge cakes covered in vanilla frosting with chocolate striped drizzle not to be confused with zebra cake recipes that involve chocolate and vanilla cake mixed in a wave marble pattern this writing this made me crave a little De debbie zebra cake i have never had one because my parents never bought them for for me for lunches, but in the cafeteria it was the most valued commodity. It was the you had the most trading power if you had a zebra cake. There was those so cosmic brownies, and afford. that was okay. That was like a silver ingot, but like the gold ingots, those were the zebra cakes. And so I never had anything good enough to trade for a zebra cake because even my whole lunch didn't compare to even one of those things. And so I never had one. <laughs> you needed like a Charizard or something. Yeah, yeah. Except Charizards are worth like $200,000 now. So no, that still wouldn't be worth it. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, okay. So how many zebra cakes? Single serve? Single ones? Or the whole package? I think there's two of them. A one cake. Okay, one cake. So I looked up the the uh, shipping weight of 10 in a box and I divided it by divided that weight by 10 and then shaved a little off for packaging. So I don't know exactly, but it's a ballpark. I'm going to say three ounces because an ounce is the heaviest thing you could be. Um, and... My answer is, well, since I was down, since I was uh, correct down to the decimal point on the last one, we're going to go with 3,786.6. Point seven. We'll round up. 3,786 zebra cakes go into the weight of one of these zebras. The correct answer is 11,360 cakes. Oh, those cakes are light. Zebra cakes are sponge cake, so there's a lot of air in there. They're a little more than an ounce, maybe. Uh-huh. Yeah, I told you an ounce is the most. Yeah, the, uh, three. When you said three ounces, I'm like, this thing is the biggest cake of all time. I'm so bad <laughs> at, these, at this, this whole ounce thing. I need to just, like... I'm like, oh, what would like an ounce of, you know, I, I track the gold, uh, like value and it's all by like one ounce. 
Um, but I was like, I don't have a g- an ounce of gold in my hand, so it's like I, I I'm trying to like, how much would that even weigh? What is a quarter Go weigh? And get a little Deborah cake, and you'll and have one ounce. Then you'll be you'll be able to have one, and you'll be able to have eaten an ounce. Yeah, this this seems like just an absolute win win situation for me. <laughs> I see no, I see no downside to this except for possibly creating a lifelong crippling addiction to little Debbie zebra cakes <laughs> that I never knew I was. That I'm so happy that I avoided as a child. Even yeah, you, you might be right because even talking about it now is triggering my uh, addiction. I did have Which the cosmic is- brownies, and those were addicting enough, and they didn't hold a candle to zebra cakes. So. Cosmic brownies are trash compared to <laughs> <laughs> disgusting garbage. Oh, I, 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 there isn't a universe where I can agree with that. Even if zebra cakes were the best thing ever, the the uh, uh, I, this is coming from someone who hasn't had a zebra cake in probably fifteen years, so. Well, um, maybe next time I make an impulsive trip to the the corner store, um, that'll be the snack I pick up. I mean, if you only love chocolate, then it's not trash compared to it. But I don't, I mean, cosmic brownies aren't even the best, like, store-bought brownie. Uh, To me, they are. I'm not a big they're, brownie they're fan. They're like dense little chocolate pucks. That's the the density. The density and the richness <laughs> is what makes it. I don't want this big fluffy. And maybe I wouldn't like zebra cakes as much as uh, cosmic brownies because, again, yeah, like I want I want something with with muscle. You know. Well, it doesn't. It's it's I it's want, like a cloud. It's like a million pounds, but it's spread over a great distance. <laughs> I don't want this big fluffy thing. But if there's I, two of them. The choice between the same amount of the same mass of like whipped cream and like cream cheese frosting, like there's there's no compare there's like it doesn't I there's no hesitation on my end. Like the 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 cream cheese frosting is going to be what I pick every time. Because I don't want this big, light, fluffy, airy thing. I want something rich and dense. Give it to me. Okay. Put it in my veins. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I got for that. Do you have any fast facts before we get into the major fact? Oh, yeah. We're talking about zebras. I, my vision kind of went red there for a second. I want the listener to weigh in and tell us whether <laughs> zebra cakes or little little Deborah's chocolate. Oh, come uh, on. But there's also neutron like. Neutron star. Oh. Is good. <laughs> it does sit like a rock, that's for sure. The rest of your digestive system will be orbiting around it for the next couple of days. <laughs> um, okay, let's let's do some fast facts. Uh, the uh, plain zebra eat, lives in eastern and southern Africa, from South Africa in the south to Kenya in the north to Mozambique in the east to Namibia in the west. Uh, it likes arid grasslands and open woodlands. Where it spends most of its time, like a horse, eating grass. It eats grasses and sedges. It's a grazer. Um, it, but it'll also eat bark, leaves, fruit, roots. Um, but the majority of its uh, diet is made up of grass. It has not quite as complicated of a digestive system as a ruminant, like a cow, that has several chambers in its stomach to eat and regurgitate. Uh, and re-eat food, um, but it still uh, is able to make do, uh, eating mostly grass. So plain zebras congregate in these large groups uh, made up of families, or harems, uh, with one dominant male, the stallion, uh, and his harem of females, the mares. And the oldest females are the highest ranking, and, uh, uh, and the harems are nomadic. Uh, so they go to wherever the water is. And some of these groups can even migrate uh, up to 300 miles, over 300 miles, uh, from one water source to another during 
from the dry from the rainy season to the no from the dry season to the rainy season this is the longest migration of any mammal in africa which i thought was crazy because i thought like wildebeest were the longest migration but i think they're just the largest migration um but interesting like it's if if you ever uh watch the the bbc section planet earth section of uh of africa where they just talk about the migrations of these animals during during the uh the dry season to go find water it's it's incredible but it seems like the zebra takes the cake <laughs> Um, so that's the plain zebras. The gra there's also gravy zebras. Uh, they have static territories where they mark them, the outline, the, the definitions of those territories with their droppings. Um, mm. any female that crosses over the dropping line, um, is now his, <laughs> it's this free of oh, open season free game. Um, more dominant males will establish these territories near watering holes because they know that females with, especially with, uh, uh, foals with young will have to come to these watering holes. So it's a little, uh, nefarious on their side. Um, but less dominant males have to mark their territories away from watering holes. And so they're less likely to get, um, females, especially ones with, with foals, um, males that don't have any females will gather into bachelor groups um and, and until they can go and establish their own harems uh zebras can survive up to a week without water which i did not know that is incredible uh that's like camel level <laughs> uh no camels can survive for longer but still it's a long time to go without water especially in the blazing african sun uh, males will fight each other over females. They're actually pretty ornery zebras in general. They're, they've accounted for, um, a lot of, uh, attacks on humans in terms of just animals attacking humans. Zebras are kind of high up there. Um, they will bite and kick each other for territory and females. Um, and they will also bite and kick their predators uh, if they can't run away, which include lions, leopards, cheetahs, hyenas, crocodiles, and wild dogs. Um, they have also been bred with other equines uh, to create hybrids that are called zebroids. They had fun with this naming convention because uh, they bred <laughs> them with horses to create zorses. They bred them with ponies to create zonies. And they bred them with donkeys to create, well, you guessed it zonkeys um man that's goofy they the the offspring of this unholy ritual is usually they're usually sterile uh and they have some sort of some sort of deformity usually dwarfism um so you know why uh <laughs> a zonkey is quite striking though it's like a donkey with striped legs. Yeah, so it's like a just a smaller, uglier zebra. Uh, a copy, basically. Um, zebras, because of their temperament, and because they have actually not... They have a pretty weak backs, uh, are not good for riding. You would think, you know... They look like small horses. There should be, like, people should have been riding zebras for centuries. Um, but a lot of attempts to ride zebras end with a broken zebra. <laughs> like, they br it breaks their back. Or a broken human. Wow. Um, because the zebra will just bite and kick until <laughs> the, the, the human doesn't want to ride it anymore. Which, I mean, if if we're able to tame wild stallions, why can't we tame zebras? I guess they're just, they have the stubbornness of mules and the frailty of something frail. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's almost as if things that are like constantly hunted by hyenas and lions and wild dogs get a kind of edge to their personality. 
But like, I mean, if you're a a horse whose ancestors were transplanted from Europe and now you live in the American wilderness, you you probably need to have a bit of a, a bit of a a per a, a personality to you. You got to be the edge. I guess, but we got rid of the wolves and there's not that many bears. There that wasn't always the case. <laughs> <laughs> True. There True. used to be a lot of wolves and bears and coyotes and mountain lions. But, I don't know. Um, zebras can communicate with their usual whooping call. You know, quagga! <laughs> um, but they also have other sounds that they can communicate with and they also use facial expressions using their lips and ears to uh, to communicate with each other and to potential threats. And so I will leave it there. At the at the this late hour, we can go on to the major fact. Okie dokie. Well, there's a major fact, white stripes. So why do zebras have stripes? You may have heard the most common answer, maybe from us. Probably. Which is that it provides pattern dis disruption. Predators like lions look at a herd of zebras and find it difficult to tell where one zebra ends and the next begins, which is important for the lion for singling out prey. However, it turns out that this is just one of many theories. In fact, there are 17 other proposed explanations with varying degrees of validity validity including like maybe it's just like a fingerprint and maybe that's how they tell each other apart which is silly because what about every other animal that isn't striped they smell each um, other i can they not uh there are other examples of animals using grouping and pattern disruption to confuse predators like schooling fish so there's precedent but the theory is really difficult to test and there aren't sufficient studies to show that lions have less success hunting zebras. We happen to know that lions love to eat zebras. So if that's true, then how come we don't see, you know, zebras are, are not on the menu often for lions. Or at least less than other things. But that's not the case. So another theory is that the stripes confuse biting flies. The African savanna has several flies that like to hang around herds, some of which carry diseases like the tsetse fly. Mm -hmm. How do you even say that? Tsetse. That is correct. Yeah, but it doesn't look like that. Tsetse. T-S-E-T-S-E. -T -S -E. Yeah, tsetse. <laughs> <laughs> In uh, 2014, ecologist Tim Caro and his team tested the theory by studying herds of zebras and horses. They found that the ho that horse flies fed on zebras less uh, than just a single patterned horse. Um, but they even found that horses that are dressed in stripes, like zebras, were bitten less. Now, if I saw a picture... And they draped the horse in, like, a blanket that covered most of its body. Yeah, that sounds like it would deter a fly if you yeah. put it in anything. It's like, we put this horse yeah. in a shirt, and for some reason, the flies didn't want to bite it anymore. But, but still, like, horses versus zebras, more in the same area with the same flies, the horses get bit more. That's something. But then they were able to, f the, to see that the flies were around the zebras... But they seem to bounce off zebras instead of landing for a bite. A possible explanation is that the stripes mess with their vision enough, the fly's vision, to prevent them from controlling their landing. Maybe something like disrupting depth perception. So you're flying in, it's a striped mess, and then you, before you know it, you're, bound, you're smacking it in the face. The flies. <laughs> These poor zebras are getting pelted by bad pilots <laughs> yeah so but they're not getting bit That's other reads uh, other researchers find it dubious 
that zebras would develop a defense against flies that would change their whole hair pattern since flies are seasonal and regional and not a high priority threat on the savanna compared to like lions and dying of thirst. Uh, <laughs> plus other herding animals have no stripes and no serious problems with flies. Uh, so another po- popular answer is thermoregulation. And this is like a long, this has been an, uh, a proposed explanation for a long time. So we know that black absorbs light and heat while white reflects them. Mm -hmm. So why have both studies on striped water barrels didn't show that the striped barrels were any cooler, but it's possible that these stripes work together with other zebra heat management abilities. So like humans, horses and zebras sweat, uh, the evaporation of sweat carries away a lot of excess of heat. So when you're sweating, it's actually the evaporation of your sweat that's taking the heat away from your body. But water that is trapped in hair or fur insulates heat and has an opposite effect. It turns you into like a sauna. Um, So zebras have a protein called latherin, which carries water to the end of their hairs where they can evaporate, where the water droplets can evaporate. So Hmm. researchers like Allison Cobb found that black stripes are consistently warmer than white stripes. So how does the temperature difference translate to cooling off? The study says, quote, we suggested, we suggest that the abrupt temperature difference between the stripes causes chaotic air movement above the hair surface, thus enhancing evaporative heat dissipation. In other words, if I understood that correctly, the stripes create a Dyson fan that causes sweat to evaporate. Because of the protein. Well, the protein is like what carries... It's so it stops them from just overheating because they have hair. Uh, the protein carries this water to the surface of their hair, the tips of their hair. They also found stuff like that their hair would, the black hair would stand on end, like would like be uh, like when your hackles are up uh, at certain times of day. And this could be like to facilitate this water leaving it. Um, but the I, my original thought was like the white reflected the heat, and the black attracted enough heat to those particular parts that it would evaporate the the water. That's what I thought at first. But then the suggestion that like it makes tornadoes on your skin. It's even crazier. Well, because so, there's a uh, there's like a warm front and a cold front on right where every black stripe is a warm front and every white stripe is a cold front, and so that just creates like yeah oh that's interesting. I but uh, I mean this is just the, a theory. The Have they measured sounds... tornadic activity around <laughs> the, around? That's kind of crazy. The um. The oh man, what was I gonna say? The um temperature, you'd think like, all right, it's a little cooler on the white stripes. But no, it's like fifteen degrees Celsius difference between the black and white stripes. Oh, that's why my black van is so hot all the time. Mm-hmm. I should have gotten a white one. Because that would have cooled mm-hmm. me off in the summer. But you can feel it when you wear like a a light colored or a dark colored t-shirt. Like that, it makes For a huge sure. difference. Yeah. Enough that like when you're walking around Epcot or Disney World, there's nobody wearing like a black shirt in the summer. And if you see someone wearing a black shirt, you're like, what are you doing? 
Yeah. And they say it's after Labor Day. I can't wear white. And, and like, then okay, you say yeah. it's always after Labor Day and always before Labor Day. What are you talking about? And then the person <laughs> says, who are you? Why are you? Why are you talking to me? Please go away. I'm trying to enjoy my vacation and sweat. And it turns out it turns out that person was a zebra. <laughs> <laughs> and you're blown away by their their the tornadoes that surround them at all times. <laughs> you just you can't bear to stand in their presence. <laughs> They're too powerful. <laughs> it's a very very powerful animal. Um, my uh, instinct is that pattern disruption is the is the strongest reason for th- zebras to adapt this. Uh, this these stripes. Because, I mean, they live in this the African savanna. It's mostly, you know, brown and greenish grasslands. Um, other animals like impalas uh, and antelopes, they their their coats blend in with the grasslands. Um, but if they get caught, or if they get discovered, they have a very good chance of outrunning most predators. Zebras aren't that fast. Uh, so they, they can't rely on just camp straight camouflage. They have to st- stick together in groups. And so if there's a bunch of them together in a group, it kind of ruins the point of camouflage in the first place. So might as well, look like one very large animal or, or massive animal uh, rather than a bunch of individuals to the predator. So that in, in, in terms of like survival of the fittest and what, what character trait would make you more likely to survive and then pass on your genes, that pattern disruption seems like the, the winner to me. Honestly, we know that like the hunting success rates of African wild dogs and other African predators in terms of percentage. So there must be a way to study like a lion's success against zebras versus other animals. Or just like does the when a, if a lion is looking at a harem or just a group of zebras, um, a herd, does it attack when they're all grouped together like that? Or does it only attack when one is separated and it can see its outline, it can distinguish that that is, that is a single zebra. I know, I, can, I know where the neck is. I can go and latch onto the neck. Um, I can see which direction it's most likely to run in. Um, and just that, that the fact that it can see just the single animal in, makes it more likely to attack that animal rather than just like, I theory, just see a bunch of stripes and hooves in front of me. Um, and do a lions just go charging into a herd of zebras and to get one. This from what I was seeing, the biggest problem with that theory is that the studies into that theory are all like studies into he- how human beings, basically like the visual perception of human beings. It's like, does that theory hold water when we're looking at zebra stripes? There's very little like, there's so many variables to like a lion. If you're just watching a lion attack a zebra or a herd of zebras, there's so many variables about maybe that that particular lion isn't very good at hunting. Maybe that particular lion isn't has never hunted zebra. Like you know, like maybe it's desperate. Maybe the zebra it saw was sick or wounded somehow uh, and went for it. Yeah, there's a lot of there are a lot of contributing factors. But it's just like I mean, you could probably collect some statistics at least. You maybe mantle, mounts like a little camera directly on top of its head, and you know, tune it to lion vision, which I'm sure it all most cameras come with these days, and um, then just make your own subjective call based on the footage you see. 
It's like, oh, I saw one, and he went for it. There you go. It's the pattern disruption. <clears throat> but th something like d get, keeping flies away, like, like you said, mm, there are a lot of large mammals, uh, you know, on the Serengeti, uh, and they don't have, they don't need stripes to keep flies away. Um, and this whole like thermal regulation like might help but it's like so what do lions not i mean i guess they pant well you could also like study a herd of zebras against other herds of other animals in the area and see if the zebras can stand to continue grazing through the heat of the day where other herds seek like shade Oh, that's a good point. But is heat, something like heat stroke so lethal that it would incur, that it would move them in this like adaptation evolutionary direction to to these stripes, as opposed I to like some other ungulate out there, like or or just any other animal, like. Well, I mean, there's other animals do different things. Like we know lion or lions, <laughs> elephants take like dust baths and stuff like that to beat the heat. Yeah. You got rhinos out there. You've got, uh, you know, all, like I said, impalas and, and antelopes and, uh, yeah. So maybe, maybe this just allows them to be outside Maybe it allows them to keep their uh, to to survive a week without water. It helps them retain water uh, because yeah, it, it you know they they their body needs to use less of it because they're not heating up as much. Well, that's all I got. All right. Well, that was uh, that was the zebra. There was a lot of information on that. It's a longer episode because it's uh, it's one of those famous animals. Um, but for you out there in podcastia gather your females kick your rival's teeth in and earn your stripes like the zebra here in life death and taxonomy Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. <laughs> I don't care if really? it's bad advice. Two in a row that were about like gathering women. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. <laughs>